Righty ho. Um, so welcome to, uh, to this beautiful centre here. I'm Sabrina Hahn. People probably know my very quiet, soft and delicate dulcet tones um, from the ABC. And uh, so the City of Melbourne have invited me to give a few talks to residents that live in the area. I've lived in the City of Melville for a very, very long time and I'm very, very old. So I, <laughs> so, um, I have witnessed changes in our climate over the last 40 years. I've been in WA for nearly 40 years. So, um, so tonight's, tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you'll all be here till midnight. Um, <laughs> So this afternoon's talk basically is what we need to do as gardeners to help us with the whole climate change or, or whether you're, you're calling it irregular weather patterns or whatever. But basically the weather patterns have most definitely changed. And um, I just have a little graph here. This is, this graph shows it's from 1910 to 2010. And it actually shows the, not just the change in climate, in air temperature, but also in water temperature. So a, a slight increase of heat in our oceans, will it has very drastic effects. So of course it changes all the currents and then it changes marine life on what can live in certain waters. And we know that different things will uh, proliferate in, in a warming climate. So as gardeners, we really need to, number one, become far more observant because we're losing that ability to be observant. And the next generations down don't have as much um, exposure to nature as we had. So for anyone that's 60 and over, as a child, you would have had access to bushland, even in the city, there was remnant bushland all over the place. And because our parents didn't want us inside the house, we were very much encouraged to go outside and play outdoors. And if you've got grandchildren, you do the same thing. You encourage them to go outdoors. I think mainly because in the olden days you had five children and God forbid five children inside a house would drive you insane. So, um, but so if we don't interact with nature that much, we don't really observe what's going on. And people are so time poor now because everything is packed in our lives. And we can find out most of the things we need to know about the world from... Mr. Google, or in, a, in front of a screen. So the amount of time we spend outdoors is probably less. So when was the last time, who here went outside and looked at a full moon? Excellent. But a lot of people don't, and a lot of parents are not taking their kids outside and saying, you know, look at the moon, beware the were werewolves. Um, <laughs> If you don't eat your veggies, you'll... <laughs> but so, so we've got this separation and it's becoming more and more, particularly in urban areas, because we have urban infill. So has everyone heard of the heat island effect? Some people have, some people haven't. Um, heat island effect is all about the, uh, the higher density within cities and we have a lot of hard surfaces we're taking away tree canopy, so the, the cities are heating up because we don't have that green coverage we used to have to cool cities down. We have a lot more bitumen, a lot more cement, a, not, a lot more rooftop to rooftop, so it's getting trapped in this. Has anyone been to Athens? That's a, that's a classic example of just, that's like a hot box in there. And because it's in a valley, it's even worse and there's no airflow. So, and if you live in the city of Melville, you would have experienced a few years ago when we get really heavy rains, the roads flood because of all 
the, the cement and the bitumen so the water is not seeping into the ground. So tree canopy loss, the majority of tree can canopy loss is coming from private dwellings now. So City of Melville has, uh, there's a lot of large blocks, they're all being divided up. So the first thing that goes, of course, is all the trees. The council has no, they can't do anything about that. There's new regulations now for apartment buildings and that, were, that went through on the 18th of February this year to say that there must be setbacks, there must be green space, there must be trees. But in private property, there's, you can't do anything about it. So I live in Willoughby and there all the, the blocks have been divided into two or three houses or eight units. And every single, every single block, every single block, every green leaf has gone. There are no trees, no shrubs, nothing. It becomes a plain flat sand pit. So in my neighbourhood alone, 182 trees have gone in the last 12 months. That's a lot of canopy cover. So we're looking at trees that have been planted in the city of Melville that are now about 65 years old, between 50 and 65 years old. So a lot of those trees are, are getting old and because of a change in climate, and the water table, the change in the levels of the water table, many of those trees are under severe stress and they're dying. So um, we, we now need to look at succession planting. So we look at trees, so things like the jacaranda trees, they're all planted at the one time and they're all dying at the one time. So you suddenly have areas where all those trees have to come out and be replaced at the same time. But it's much better to actually stage that planting. And that's, that happened in Melbourne as well, when they lost all those beautiful old trees. So we need to think about the long term over 100 years of planting. So the city of Melville will now have different areas where there'll be avenue planting, but other areas where there'll be a much bigger diversity of tree planting. So in your neighbourhood, if you are getting new trees put in, it would be really lovely to think that people would come on board and they would help to maintain those trees. Because with urban infill, every single tree we have will be vitally important to negate that heat island effect. So plant selection. We traditionally, when I came here and I started up my landscaping business, I uh, foolishly tried to talk people into putting native gardens in. That's a long time ago. I'm oh, such a trailblazer. Uh, <laughs> no one wanted my gardens <laughs> because um, I was very pro-native. So I'd come over from the eastern states where we actually had soil um, and rainfall in summer. So when I first came over, I probably killed thousands of plants for the first, till I cottoned on that, oh, this sand goes all the way down. <laughs> And oh, look, the water just rolls off it. Um, so, so now we, and, and a lot of the, the gardens that were around were, of course, styled on the co English cottage garden sort of thing. And we, we now know that our rainfall is so much less that our summers are going on and on and on and on. Mind you, I had to pull the old doona out last night. It was a little bit chilly. So autumn is now becoming like a mild summer. We do get our, the drop in temperature at night time, but the, those warm weather patterns in the daytime are continuing longer and longer, and that has an effect on plant growth. So plant selection, we need to really think about what plant suits an area. Do you want to be pouring water and fertiliser on a plant to keep it alive? It's not really sustainable. 
There's also been, um, there's a lot of issues around the drop in the water table, their salinity, phytophthora, I'll talk a bit about that later on. So there's a lot of stresses on our gardens now. So it's all about thinking what we can do to give our gardens the best possible chance of survival in a changing climate. But when you're thinking about plant selection, don't just think of yourself. Because when we take out whole gardens and all big tracts of bushland, you have to remember that all the birds, all the insects, all the frogs, all the lizards, snakes, people don't like those very much, um, all that, that big collection of things that live in that environment now have nowhere to live. So when um, we have developments where they clear scrape, land scraping, I call it, um, the amount of organisms that go with that bushland is astonishing and it doesn't come back. So many of our woodlands, you know, those trees are hundreds of years old when you go further out in the bush. So the cycle, everything's in a system and we forget about the system because we think we control the system. But we are only one species within a system and it will be to our peril that we don't care about all the other species that live within that system. So when you're designing your garden, it's really important to think what else will come to my garden if I have this, this, this and this. So everyone's heard of the canary in the coal mine? Well, they're using now the honey possum, basically to check to see the, the viability of bushland because the honey possum only, only lives on nectar. So it needs a source of nectar. Actually, the honey possums are about that big. Um, so they must have a source of nectar for 12 months of the year. So if you've got the right kind of biodiversity, the honey possums will come and thrive. And it's the same with encouraging birds and beneficial insects into our garden. If we have a food source, they're safe from predators, then they will come and water. So as a gardener, it's great because you don't have to do any work, which I think is marvellous. Because in the afternoon, rather than go out there and use sprays to kill insects, you can sit down with a liquid beverage and um, just enjoy your garden rather than go, oh my God, I've got to kill the white fly that are all over my broccoli, which is what's happening to my broccoli at the moment. <laughs> but um, <laughs> so now I'm going to try and spray them with red wine and see what that does. <laughs> I know it's a waste. I'll get it in a flagon or something. <laughs> um, and there's, you know, it's really interesting. After a few years, you will get to see more and more insects and birds and lizards coming into your garden if you have a bigger diversity of plant species. Western Australia, particularly um, around Perth, we have the most amazing nurseries. And the biodiversity of plants that is available now is incredible. And we also have things like the Kings Park plant sales who sell really rare plants that are under threat. And you can get, you know, and there's plant hunters that go out and do all the work for you. They get the cuttings and then they'll bring them in and they grow stuff from seed and then they fiddle with them and make hybrids. So we're very, very lucky that we have a big base of nursery so we can increase the diversity of plants we're having in our gardens. But it's all about soil. For all gardeners, the number one thing is soil. Now, eventually the trees will reach the gutless, hydrophobic, nutrient-poor sandy soil that we, that we live on. So large trees, will actually hit that soil. But if you want fruit trees, if you want a veggie garden, you must improve the soil. 
So there was a school of thought that said, if you put endemic species into your garden, so species even within this area that are naturally found here, you just put them in the ground and you don't need to do anything. If you do that, it will probably die. Mm -hmm. The reason is that plant is grown in a nursery. It's grown in a really lovely free draining potting mix. It's watered twice a day, in summer three times a day. It's being given slow release fertilizer. So if you just take that plant and go, you're on your own now, kid, it will not thrive. And don't forget in natural selection, you would have an enormous amount of seed and from 500 seeds, you'd get 10 plants that eventually. So we can short track that. Um, and so we can build the soil up. Compost is absolutely a wonderful, wonderful thing. There's all sorts of stuff that's out there now for gardeners. So you've got, so people don't understand the difference between compost and soil conditioner. Compost is usually heat treated and it's aged. So they've kept it for a longer period of time um, and it's broken down much more so than soil conditioner. So compost is like the, you know, the Nivea cream of facials, or you can tell I don't have them, so I've got nothing <laughs> with whatever some expensive brand of face stuff is. Um, so <laughs> I'm not really into beauty, as you can see. <laughs> so um, compost is essential. If you live on sandy soils, the best thing you can put in is clay. So this whole thing of wettability, the soil will repel water. So we need to break down that hydrophobic quality of the soil. And we do that with wetting agents. Now a research paper came out from Curtin Uni about six weeks ago. They trialled 30 different wetting agents, both granular and liquid, and they found that none of them were effective after three weeks. <laughs> the most effective thing they found for that was clay. However, in saying that, you still need to use a wetting agent. So you do all your soil improvement, you still use a wetting agent because you still need to get sand going into those particles. But then you've got your compost and your clay, so it actually holds onto it. So under a microscope, you've got, you've got sand. So sand will be about the size of a basketball. So this is what our soil looks like. Clay will be the size, we'll make clay purple because I like orange and purple. So clay will be about the size of this. So you can see how the clay particles fill up all those air gaps. But also because of the, the makeup of clay, it actually sticks together. So never use clay just on the surface of your garden because you will create a dam. It must be mixed in with the sand. Compost is heaving with life, heaving. So if you go to fertile, beautiful volcanic soils, there will be billions of microscopic life in there. We have a lot less in our coastal sands. <laughs> um, but what we need to do is try and encourage the biology in the soil. So we can do that by increasing things like humic acid, all the organic matter, manures, that actually gives, provides food for microscopic fungi and bacteria. Thankfully, they now have manufactured microscopic soil, fungi and bacteria. So there was, um, some broadacre farmers, were well, they're sheep farmers down the southwest, and they started doing research into their sheep and lambs. Not, not the soil, they were just traditional farmers. 
and they started looking at the nutrient density of the sheep. And then they started trialling different paddocks, doing different things, sort of switching to more organic way of growing all their crops. Then they found that the, that the sheep were actually much stronger, healthier and weighed more. And then when they did the testing on the, on the flesh, it had much greater nutrient density. Then they, had, they brought two soil biologists over that started testing the soil over a 10 year period. They found that the biology in the soil on the, on the crops where they were using more sort of organic inputs and they didn't use Roundup, that the, that the pasture was so much better. And when they tested the roots and the leaf tissue of the plant, they found that those plants were uptaking all the nutrients. And when the sheep ate the crop, they were getting the nutrients through, through the crop. So they have developed this microscopic, a little bucket of microscopic fungi and bacteria that they spread all over the paddocks and they also put it on the fertiliser that they use for the crop. They've encapsulated the fertiliser with the microscopic fungi and bacteria. And I've been trialling it all around the place and I use it in my garden and it's made a remarkable difference. So, because um, I'm not on, on the ABC, I can tell you what it's called. <laughs> so it's Grow Safe Soil Microbes. <coughs> they also make a fertiliser. But the microbes actually gets that biology back into the life of the soil. Now this is how it works. Microscopic fungi and bacteria lives in the soil and it must be, particularly the fungi, has this symbiotic relationship with the roots of plants. So the fungi and bacteria locks itself into the roots of the plants. Then, because it's, uh, a, the, you know how fungi and bacteria spread, if you've had, you know, bacterial infections or fungus on your feet or whatever, apparently it spreads. Um, so it connects with other microscopic fungi and bacteria. So this all happens under the soil and of course you cannot see it. Then they all link up together. So it means that a tree down, say this, lovely tree here, the roots of that tree can send messages to the roots of this tree via fungi and bacteria in the soil. And it's a survival mechanism. So in times of drought or stress when a tree is under attack from either disease or a pest, this tree will signal that tree and say, I'm under attack. So those messages go through and it's been filmed. It's, it's like a, a, a chemical trail. So the messages go via the fungi through the root system to this root system. So this tree will get the heads up four hours earlier. So this one now is changing the hormones in it to make it sap bitter so whatever's stripping and eating it isn't so tasty anymore. But it's already under attack. So it sends via all these microscopic fungi messages to all the trees around it saying, change your hormone now, get your bitter sap happening because there's a big mob of locusts coming through. So we, ha we haven't understood soil biology very much and we never, we sort of ignored it. And in Western Australia, we don't have a lot of soil biologists, but it is becoming uh, a very interesting part of science now because we're discovering more and more and more. There is a bacteria that attacks root not nematode. So under an electron microscope you see this bacteria and it wraps itself around the eel worm which is microscopic you can't see it either. Um, wraps itself around the eelworm and then it extracts all the juices out of it. And it's really effective in controlling root knot nematode. Mm. And in some countries, they're actually using bacteria to fight different 
nematodes and it's been very, very successful. So we're learning all this stuff. So the one thing that will really make a difference to the health of your plants is getting the soil biology back. So we need those inputs. Um, and then of course the, they need, they require water to stay alive, but they also help plants deal with water stress. So when plants are in a drought situation, because through the microscopic fungi and bacteria, they share all their resources. So that means they can cope a lot better with times of drought and heat. So it's a very important thing to help us to actually try and keep our, our plants surviving those really, really tough times. The other thing that's happened now, of course, people are on bores and the board, the quality of the water is now changing. If you live in um, Hoiti Toiti, Peppermint Grove, Mosman Park, Cottesloe, um, a lot of those people have had to shut their bores down because the salt levels are just way too high. And of course, we have a big drop in the water table because of the overuse of bore water as well. So I have a bore because um, Water Corp, oh, I should be careful, it's being filmed. <laughs> in, the, in, the, uh, in the area of Willoughby, um, the water pipes uh, were put down when all the houses were built straight after the Second World War because Willoughby was returned servicemen housing and Aboriginal housing. So the pipes are very old. So what happens is we get sinkholes in our road because the pipes burst and then it eats away all the sand and then half the road collapses and you've got this bloody great big hole. So rather than replace all the pipes around these older poor suburbs, they come and they turn the outlet into your house down to a trickle. So they change the metres, so the amount of water coming into your house I cannot run one pop-up sprinkler. That's how bad the water pressure is in my house. So the, they had a campaign saying, um, uh, encouraging water users to inform them if they had a leak. <laughs> so I did. <laughs> I told them about all the leaks in the major pipes that are underneath our roadways. Um, and perhaps if they fix those up, then we could have a little bit more pressure in our house. So as a gardener, there's no way I could have a garden with that small trickle. If ever I'm in a fire, I'm stuffed. <laughs> like I'm just, <laughs> well now I can turn the sprinklers on. But um, that's a side really. I don't know why I went down that track. I like to whinge about things from time to time. <laughs> um, who was I? Soil biology, microbes, water, yes. So, so the sharing of resources helps them to survive those times of drought. Now, if you're using Australian plants, many of the plants actually come from Queensland and New South Wales in that they have very different soil type to us. So do be careful, a lot of the... Uh, uh, bush tucker stuff is from the Northern Territory, Queensland, so it requires a lot of water in summer. So you just need to be aware of that. Um, West Australian plants are very soil specific and that's what I love about the Kings Park plant sale is they will tell you where that plant comes from and the soil type it's in because the soil type changes drastically in Western Australia. And many of our plants have evolved with the type of biology of our soil and certainly the nutrients that are or are not in it. So it's not just the physical makeup of the soil. So it's not just the fact whether it's loam or clay or sand over clay or duplex or it's, it's more than that. So banksia plants in particular so has everyone heard don't put fertilizer on banksias and grivalilis and, and, and hakeas the reason is that over the millions of years banksias have evolved a different entirely different root system so they form these cluster roots 
and on the end of each of these cluster roots there are more micro roots they in in with there's three microscopic fungi that they work with the fungi extracts the very small amount of phosphorus in our soils and it's very small delivers it straight to the plant so plants from even over east and from overseas cannot do that they can't access the phosphorus it's not available to the plant but our species have evolved along with the, its microscopic fungi that it can actually extract it. And then because it's got these cluster roots, it can grab as much as it, it possibly can. That's why if you put a phosphorus fertiliser on all of that, that family, you're overdosing it and it will die. Usually the leaves will turn purple and then it's all over, Red Rover. Just, on, um, just on, on the soil, it's really, if you are going to keep chickens, get your soil tested for pesticides that were used a lot in the 1950s, 60s and 70s because the residue can stay for up to 300 years on some of those pesticides mm -hmm. and of course it is concentrated in an egg. So do not get chickens without getting your soil tested. It's actually interesting to get your soil tested anyway. You need to know more than the pH. So you can buy the pH testing kits. Your soil will nearly always be towards purple, which means it's alkaline. If you've got bore water, the bore water is alkaline because it comes through the limestone at the base. So alkalinity is a big problem and put stresses. So um, who's got lemon trees or orange trees or citrus trees? Yep, you can all leave now because I'm not answering any of those questions. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. <laughs> we did an outside broadcast at the Manning Markets this morning and I could not believe it. The first four questions were bloody lemon tree questions. <laughs> I still, I'm still sure they rigged that somehow. <laughs> but you will see that you have alkaline soils straight away in citrus because you'll have the veins will be green but the leaves will be yellow. And then you'll get yellow blotching. So what happens when soils are alkaline or acid? There's certain elements, minerals, that the plant cannot access. So even if you pour the fertiliser on, the plant still cannot access those nutrients without microscopic fungi and bacteria. So the microscopic fungi and bacteria will break that down into a form where the plant roots can uptake the nutrients. Foliar fertilising is very important in fruit trees if you live in alkaline or acid soils because the, the nutrients, the minerals can be absorbed through the leaf tissue. So leaves, as we know, breathe. That's why people are putting more and more indoor plants in their house, because they give us oxygen at night. They usually die not long. If you're going to have indoor plants, the trick is to buy two or three of exactly the same plant and rotate them. But if you want to be mean to your kids, you buy them one plant and then every week you go there, you go, how's my plant going? <laughs> um, there's no such thing as an indoor plant, but have lots of them in your house. Just replace them um, because they, they, are, they filter out all the toxins inside your house and they're happy little things and you get all sorts of little bugs flying off them. <laughs> and if you get the, um, you know, the fungus gnats, I always go off track. We'll get to the rest of this in a minute. Um, you know the fungus gnats in indoor plants? You'll see them, they'll be tiny little things. <laughs> the best way to control those is cut up little pieces of potato and put them around the top of the pot. You only need about four pieces. They love potato. I don't know why. They're probably going to make gnocchi later <laughs> on. Probably Italian. Um, but they go to the potato and they lay their eggs in the potato and they're breeding that and you just 
throw the potato, or you'd eagerly cook them up. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then you just freeze it, microwave it, or don't bury it, um, and, you, and the whole population drops down. It's, quite, it's a very organic way of doing things. I don't know how the hell I found it. I found it on Google, I think. <laughs> um, but some obscure kind of Googling that went on. Uh, now, I want you to ask me questions as we go along. I don't want you all sitting there going, oh, when she shut up. <laughs> um, so I want you to ask me questions as we go along. So are there any questions so far? Well, I'd like to know where you get milk. Oh, the gross safe soil microbes. Like where, where would you get it? Oh, okay. Um, so Dawson's Nurseries have it. We also have an office um, in Applecross on Canning Highway. I never remember the address, isn't it bad? <laughs> uh, it's Unit 23, <laughs> 784. I think it's that. I think this is <laughs> Unit 23. Uh, can you look at it? Thank you, Tim. Yeah, it's because I dry. I, I just go there. I never know. Um, it's either two eight four or eight four six or. <laughs> I'll put it up for you. But it's in Applecross. I know that much. And it's Canning Highway. What's the office called? Then? It's called Sabrina Hahn. Oh, right. <laughs> I don't know this. <laughs> you have to ring because. I'm not always there. In fact, I'm really there, really. But um, uh, my daughter, who's my admin, come media, come accountant, come, she does everything, dog's body, cat herder. Um, she's there. So I'll, I'll give you the email address as well. Oops. What is it? Your daughter does a good job. I know, that's the website. Oh, thank you. Thank you. There we are. Look. Because I don't write to myself. Right, that's it. Admin. Thank you very much. I don't know what I'd do without you guys. Um, and that's my name. I remember that. For now. For now. Com dot au. How are we going with the address there, Tim? Yeah. Where is it on the address? Oh, I don't know. Website. It'll be on the website. 784 wasn't even close. 784 Canning Highway. Right, so any of those will work for you. So if you can't get it, but Dawson's have got it, and there's Dawson's in South Street here. Yes, I will not answer your gardening questions if you email them to me um, because I get about 5,000 a day. So, um, Unless it's really interesting or unless you're offering a case of wine. <laughs> 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 yeah. uh, are there other questions? Anything about the soil or...? It's a great question. So the question is relating to what happens if you've already got an existing garden? You're not going to rip all your plants out to do all that soil prep stuff. Really good question. Okay, so there are things that are three-pronged forks like that. So the compost will, the compost isn't an issue because that will sink through and work its way down. It's the clay. So when you put the clay in, you must, like around the area, get the, the little three-pronged fork or on a long thingy if your knees are as bad as mine. Um, and as long as you can turn it into, you know, the, that, that much soil, if you can mix it in with that, that will do the job. The microbes you put on top of the soil, no problem at all. Um, so that will make an enormous difference. When you've got the clay and the compost, you still need to use mulch. Now, I want to talk about mulch because we all need to use it. Um, with, does that answer your question, by the way? Um, 
we now know that um, wood chip mulch over if it's used over a period of time and you keep using it it actually develops a fungus that is not good so the fungus develops like all these little threads underneath the the wood chips and it grows there and it's completely hydrophobic so it will stop water from getting through now the reason that grows and you'll see it'll have all these fine threads because wood chips is carbon so it cannot break down without nitrogen so that fungus develops to try and access nitrogen to help it to break down so if ever you are using wood chips always put on blood and bone or something that's got a nitrogen content but you shouldn't use it again and again. You should change your mulch. So it's still okay to use lupin, lucerne and pea, but um, which is excellent for your veggie garden and all your fruit trees because you give them more water. But on a native garden or an Australian or Mediterranean garden, that you're not watering it that much. So what sort of mulch do you use? You've got to make sure that the mulch that you, you get has come from the entire tree, not just the trunk and not just the wood. And you do certainly do not want just wood chips. So it must be like, I think they call it environment mulch. or So it'll have the leaves and the fruits and the nuts and the, the whole tree. That is fine to use. That's not a problem. But I would still throw around a bit of blood and bone. Be very careful with blood and bone. Kings Park killed off a whole pile of their native plants because the blood and bone they used wasn't real blood and bone and it was full of urea and just burnt everything. You will know proper blood and bone. So there's a lot of blood and bones on the market but the cheap stuff is rubbish and it's full of urea, it's packed. So the real blood and bone uh, is dense and heavy. So if ever you've had a loved one in your family and you've got to bring them home in a shoebox, you, you know just how heavy you'll think, God, she's almost as heavy as she was while she was walking around. Um, it's very dense. Um, so <laughs> we, had, we had our mother divvied up between the five children and we put her in little nest cafe jars because we all live in different areas of, uh, of Australia. And uh, my daughter collected the mail and opened the mail and she, she thought, hmm, someone's posted mum coffee. That's pretty weird. <laughs> Took the lid off. <laughs> Had a look at it, smelt it and thought, hmm, it smell like coffee. Um, it took me a while to pluck up the courage to tell her what was actually in the coffee jar. <laughs> um, so I do know that Yates, the blood and bone that Yates have is proper blood and bone. It's real blood and bone. So I'd stick to that brand if I were you. There's all sorts of other things like biochar, um, fermented uh, molasses. Fermented molasses is very, very interesting what it does with, um, with microscopic life. It appears to be very, very good. Then there's the neem cake. Has anyone heard of that? You know the neem tree, which is the like a Cape lilac sort of tree. Um, they, they're making a cake out of all the, the leaves and the fruit. Um, and it appears to be really, really good for microscopic fungi and bacteria. They seem to feed on it. They love it. So there's all sorts of stuff out there. Um, so basically what you find works for you, use it. Um, be very careful with coffee grounds because in the long term they make the soil quite alkaline. You're better off using coffee grounds in your compost. Break it down a bit first before you use it on your plants because over a period of time it makes the soil alkaline. Sydney of University did lots of you know, five-year testing on coffee grounds. Um, any other questions before we... Can you have a bad compost? Yes. Oh, yes. Can you have a bad compost? Absolutely. You can have a compost that is just full of bacterial slime. 
Um, who here has had a crack at compost? It's a bit tricky, isn't it? Mm. Mm. So the thing about compost is, well, you know, I was talking about carbon and nitrogen. So most things has carbon and nitrogen, most things. Um, but with a compost heap, so compost need, this is what compost need. Everyone's got that now. I'll try and remember where I live. <laughs> so they need... We'll make it in green. We haven't done green yet. So they need oxygen, water, carbon, nitrogen, oh, with it, mm, nitrogen. Who else can tell me the fifth one? You'll be tested on this, so come on. <laughs> Sorry? No. No. Life. What? Light. Mm. Heat. Yeah. Okay. So, now, what happens is if you've got the right amount of carbon and, and nitrogen and you've got water, it'll start to breed a bacteria. So the bacteria creates the heat. Without the bacteria and the heat, it can't break down. The, it needs, it's fired up by oxygen. So you get oxygen in there by turning the heap. But you don't turn it until it, the, the bacteria starts to grow through the heap. The big thing is how much carbon and how much nitrogen and how much moisture. And that's where people get confused. So you need four parts dry. One part wet. So dry is things like paper hay, straw, dried lawn clippings. That's all the dry components. Wet is things like manure, your kitchen, your veggie kitchen scraps. Anything that's high in nitrogen is usually wet. And where people go wrong, so when you put in your little Fogo veggie scrap that's in your little Fogo bin, which thank you very much, City of Melville. Wonderful initiative. I love the Fogo bins. So when you've got one of those buckets and you put a little bucket of veggie scraps into your compost bin, you have to have four buckets of straw or hay. So never try and make compost without a bale of straw or hay. If you've got the bale there, it's so much easier. You can buy straw and hay from all the pet supply stores. But remember, one bucket of veggie scraps or one bucket of manure, four buckets of hay or straw. Then you've got to make sure that it's moist enough. So you just run the hose over it and always have it covered, always. The most, um, the best way of making compost is for one cubic metre is the quickest. So you can either have it in a Dalek bin or you just have a bay, but one cubic metre. Now where people go wrong is they don't stop composting. You can't just keep adding stuff. You've got to make your compost six weeks, does the thing and off she goes but people keep adding to it. So you start this cycle all over again, 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 again. You've got to stop fiddling with your compost. So you make it, then you leave it. Now, it'll heat up and you'll see the steam coming off it and you leave that go for a few days because you want the bacteria to really kick in. And then you start to turn it and you turn it every day. If you do it on a full moon, you're allowed to do it naked. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Um, so unless it gets hot, then you'll get all sorts of insects and cockroaches and stuff that breed in there. I went to a school once and they were so proud because they've got this whole sustainability program and they've got veggies and fruit trees and they took me down to their all their composting bins and I lifted up the lid and I reckon there would have been about a thousand cockroaches oh, in each yeah. bin. Just, just, <laughs> I just put the lids on and I said quietly to the teacher, I would just, um, on the weekend I'd get rid of those, all the compost uh, and take, because that's a bit of a health hazard that's going on in there, it's not. Yeah? If it goes sour, then what do you do to it? Okay, so if it goes sour as in slimy? Well, just, you know, if, if it's too much of the wet stuff, and I mean, apart from correcting the yep. soil, yep. can you add? I'd get rid of it because you've just, you the, the type of bacteria that's in there you don't want. Okay. So ditch it and it's, start so afresh. If you've got the um, uh, cockroaches or whatever, can you aerate it to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, to yep. That yep. Yeah. yep. And if you've got cockroaches, then diatomaceous earth works really well. Um, so that's a very, very fine, fine, fine clay. And under a microscope, it's like shards of glass. So most insects have an outside skeleton, an exoskeleton. Gets underneath the exoskeleton and rips them to shreds. <laughs> so I use diatomaceous earth in all my cutlery drawers and not these drawers, but the other. <laughs> yeah. No meat, no meat. Uh, definitely no meat because that will most certainly attract rats. And I have, I have a very healthy population of rats at my place. They, um, they feed well. They like a balanced diet <laughs> of fruit and vegetables. <laughs> so is, did people have problems with rats? It, it's, it gets worse at my place when they bulldoze the old houses down because they all go, oh, I know, go to Sab's place. She's got fresh stuff there, it's great. Come and join us. <laughs> and don't you try and control them? I have got a pair of boo book owls that nest in a pepper tree at the back of my place. So I don't use rat bait because that's the biggest killer for all those all those birds. How do you get them in? How do you oh how do you get the owls in? I don't know. <laughs> well I have trees. And rats. Have trees and rats. Um, <laughs> and veggies. And veggies. They love pomegranates. Put a pomegranate tree in. And tomatoes, capsicums, chilies. They, chilies. They love, um, what's the other thing they like? They love guavas. Um, yep, yep. No, 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 actually they haven't touched, they don't touch my figs and they don't touch the passion fruit. I don't know why they don't eat figs. What do the owls nest in? What's the tree that... Oh, it's a pepper tree. Pepper tree. Yeah, not peppermint, but pepper tree. Because it's very dense, so I think they're quite... But also near the pepper tree, I've built myself a cubby house. So I waited for all the children to leave home so I could have my own cubby house. <laughs> but it's, it, it's, on the, it, it's on the ground, but it's got a rooftop garden. And um, so I sit up there some nights. <laughs> Got to be careful because I have to climb up the ladder. <laughs> but I have to go down the ladder later on in the evening. I take the bottle up with me. <laughs> I was thinking of getting a little pulley system, actually. I must, I must design that. Yeah, yeah. That. <laughs> um, and that's how I know that, because I was just sitting there one night having some liquids and um, I heard them because they have a, a distinct call. And I thought, oh, I must drink another glass. That sounds great. <laughs> Because uh, I, I do an overnights program and so quite often I have to drink to keep myself awake till 1.30am. Um, so I was sitting up the treehouse at 1 o'clock in the morning, which as you know, as you do. And, um, and then I heard them 
and I watched them come down and get a rat. It was all, it was like David Attenborough moment. It was just classic. Now I was talking to some, we're off track again. I was talking to, but it's all about the environment. I was talking to um, one of the ag guys about the baits that they use because Murdoch University did a, a big study on all the predatory birds and, and 80, more than 80% of them when they did the autopsy it was rat bait that killed them. Oh. He, he gets rid of our rats for us. Oh, really? Yes. See, you should rent him out. And he, ah. he will kill till he holds them up so my husband has to come out and kill them. <laughs> <laughs> He's a humane dog, really. <laughs> That's great. But, um, but that, so they were saying that there's, there's two generations of, of rat poison. So it's the second generation of rat poison that's the worst because it doesn't break down in the rat's body. So when the birds eat the rat, they, they get it from that. So if you're going to use rat bait, then, then get the first generation rat bait. And I can't remember which one it is because I don't use it at all. Traps, rats are very clever. I got terribly excited and I got one of those um, electric ones where that gives them a shot. So excited because I caught one trap and I heard it. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. That was the only rat I ever caught in it. No other rat went to it. So now I just live with the rats. I mean, it can't be worse than my kitchen floor, I figure. So just on the environment, you know, cleaning products are shocking. You don't need to use them. You just have, um, if you've got any babies, little, little kids or grandchildren, when they're crawling, you put little sponges on their knees. <laughs> they're great. I, I remembered, I had, um, my, my daughter had some um, friends, she's a paramedic and she had some friends coming around. She said, do you think you might whip a mop over the floor? And I said, no, but you're very welcome to. And then I thought, when did I last mop the kitchen floor? And that, it was when my sister was here at Christmas because she actually did it. <laughs> but because I spend so much time out in the garden, I figure I'm just bringing the garden inside, really. It's, it's, all, it's all good. You can just use water anyway. Exactly. Well, I don't use any, any of that other stuff anyway. Vinegar's great yeah. um, and eucalyptus oil. And I don't care really, I live there with the dog, the dog doesn't mind. Um, right, pests and diseases. How are we going for time? Oh, heaps of time. Okay, uh, so most of the calls that come in to the ABC are to do about pests and diseases. Oh, lemon trees. <laughs> um, now, we know that most plants have their own mechanisms to cope with pest and disease, but we interfere and that breaks that system that occurs. When you prune a tree, when you take a limb off a tree, the tree automatically sends a signal to bring up different things to seal that wound. You can't see it but it sends, a, um, it's almost like a antibiotics sort of through the sap stream to actually seal that wound off. So it's protected from diseases in particular. But we go and spray with steriprune or paint it with acrylic paint and that disrupts that whole system that the tree already has to protect itself. The only time I would say you need to do that is where there's a rip or a tear and it's gone into the cambium layer on a, in a long strip. Or if you've got pawpaw trees, when you do a cut, you need to put a tin or a can on it because it will rot all the way down. So you should prune your pawpaw trees after fruiting. You just cut the top off, stick a bucket on top. Otherwise it will rot. There are diseases and pests that will be love our changing climate. So fungal diseases, for instance, because we're becoming more humid 
and the weather, the warm weather's longer. So fungal diseases love it <coughs> and they're proliferating. Insects are having an extra breeding cycle because the weather's warmer for longer. And we will all know that as gardeners. And we get, you know, we're getting the pests that we had up the top of Western Australia are now starting to move down like those racehorse bloody grasshoppers. Yeah, and they're, I mean, they're, they're huge. Um, so there will be certain things mm. that are favourable and others that you, do, you do definitely don't want. Let's talk about Phytophthora because people don't think that they can get Phytophthora or die back in their garden, but it is rampant in, in Perth. Um, areas in uh, uh, Peppermint Grove, Dalkeith, Cottesloe, Claremont, with, I do, con I do consulting and I've, the first thing I do when I look at a tree is I get the root tested because if you get soil tested for dieback, it's not, it's not really enough, you need to take part of the root um, because they'll grow the phytophthora on the root to see what, what's in there. So if you have Phytophthora in your garden, it will affect many, many, many things and many ornamentals, not just native plants. So the, the first indicators are things like citrus trees, roses, and of course, banksias. And if you get up on the top of your cubby house, if you think you've got dieback or someone else's tree, you will see a line of where the dieback's coming through because it follows the water course underground. So the, 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 it's a water mould will come through. Um, the other thing we have now on all our beautiful eucalyptus ficifolias and all the marries is canker. So red gum canker, which we had before in 1968, there was huge uh, massive problem all across the state and now it's come back. So a lot of the street trees that are the, the physifolia, they're dying, they're just riddled with canker. And there's nothing that uh, we can do, it's a bit like dieback. Um, there's some trees around uh, where I live that are the uh, native frangipani and they've been absolutely hammered by an aphid and scale. They've got scale as well. Sooty mould is completely coating them and it's killing them. So when it comes to pests and diseases, the most important thing is correct diagnosis. Because what happens is people put a fungicide on a pest issue or vice versa. They'll use an insecticide on a, on a fungus and that's not going to do any good whatsoever. So identification is so important. So who here has the My Pest Guide app? Is it? Yep. Yeah? So a couple of people have heard of, it, heard of it. It's an app that's been made by the Ag Department and I recommend everyone should get it. It's a great app. So... Yep, they've got those. My Pest Guide. So you just download it on your smartphone. You take a picture of whatever you think it is or the symptom. You send it off to them. They get back to you within 48 hours. They'll tell you what it is and what you need to do about it. It's great. It's fantastic. Now, the reason the Ag Department have done that is because they want to try and control pests that we shouldn't have here that are coming in and no one knows about it until they're a major problem. So case in point is the European wasp. Now, I did a story on it and I got Daryl Hardy, who's the chief entomologist at the Ag Department, in on air to talk about it. They had 320 people ring in, phone in, email in, and out of that, they got 10 definite European wasp nests. So the reason the Ag Department do it is that so the general public can get in, involved in trying to control these pests. And it's working really, really well. 
They haven't got one for diseases, but um, <sighs> diseases are a lot harder to control. Remember with pests that for most pests, there is a predator. So even if you use pyrethrum or the garlic chili spray or your own <coughs> soap wash, whatever you spray, that will also kill the beneficial insects. So you must look at what you think you have first. Get a magnifying glass because quite often you'll see the predator right in among the pest because that's what they eat. So things like ladybirds lay their eggs in amongst a rose that's completely covered with aphids. And then when the ladybird turns into a larvae, she can eat 300 aphids a day. She or he, if it's a she. Um, and the, there's little tiny predatory wasps. You probably won't see them. They're very, very small. And they parasitize aphids and scale. If you look at scale or aphids, and well, scale's a bit hard to tell because they're white and round anyway, but aphids, you'll see some of them are rounded and they're quite hard when you squish them. They've been parasitized by the little wasp. So not all wasps are bad. You don't want them sort of hovering above your entry to your door, of course. Um, things like spiders, and native bees are highly susceptible to insecticides. Spiders are your best friend. <laughs> they are, <laughs> some people may not feel that way. <laughs> but in your garden, you'll have hundreds of spiders. You don't even know they're there. Especially the little flower spiders, they're tiny and they just hop from, yeah, hop from flower to flower. But it's good to have spiders in your garden because they're great predators. Most people will have seen the little wolf spiders that run across the... If you pick one up and have a close look at it, they're so beautiful. So they have, like, they have two rows of eyes, okay? So they have, they have big eyes here. Then they'll have a little, little row here. And then sometimes they'll have another two just on the side. It's almost like a smiley face, isn't it? <laughs> I love spiders. We grew up in New Guinea and my, uh, they have the bird-eating spiders there. You know, that have their big, they're quite large and they have these massive nests. And I still remember as a child, because my dad was, he was such a bushman, just unbelievable and, and taught me so much. And I remember him handing me, when I was d tiny, tiny, this big spider and saying you should never be afraid of these and I and I never have been because I except it fell off my hand because I was only a little but spiders are great I if the redbacks are outside I leave them I never kill them you don't I mean they're not going to leap at you if they're inside I'll kill them actually I don't I take them outside <laughs> It's funny, isn't it? Because I don't mind eating sheep, cattle and, um, and chickens. But um, I thought spiders are such beautiful things. Imagine what it would be like having like eight eyeballs. <laughs> so awesome. You'd be able to see what the kids are doing over there. But I, I wrote an article on wolf spiders and I've got the most... You have to get whatever paper it's in. I don't know, Habitat in a couple of weeks. It's the most fantastic shot of a wolf spider and it is so cute. <laughs> You'll just want one. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so how can we get, like, can we breed them up? Yes, that's a great question. How can you breed up ladybirds? Well, I have to tell you that ladybirds are t horn bags, basically. <laughs> They're not ladies at all. <laughs> Out of all the insect world, they have the highest rate of STIs, <laughs> they are constantly at it. All you need to do is give them a food source because they'll do it while they're eating aphids as well. <laughs> but so with ladybirds, the main thing that they need is a really big food source because they do eat a lot of aphids. That's their favorite food. 
they will nest, they will lay eggs in any tree. Like I had them laying eggs in, in my wattle tree, which never gets aphids or insect pests. Uh, oh, you, well, you won't see them. Yeah, yeah. So they're, they're, yeah, yeah. So they're a yellow colour. They're usually on the backs of the leaves or they'll, um, you, you kind of need a magnifying glass to see them. And they lay them in clusters. So you'll see them, they're all. But the main thing is, if you spray, if you use any pesticide, insecticide, whether it's eco oil, whatever, it will kill the ladybird larvae in particular. So it's the larvae that eat more than what the adult ladybird does. Um, so if you don't use any sprays, and you give them a food source. So basically, if you've got roses or something with aphids on it, like my broccoli, um, if you leave that there, get a magnifying glass and just see, you'll see the larvae in among them, eating them. And whitefly are a kind of aphid. They're another type of aphid, but they breed prolifically. Mm -hmm. But you can buy ladybirds. You can buy ladybirds. So, yes, yes. So, you can buy lots of the predatory insects now. Some, the ag department don't let in here. So, I think the fungi eating ladybird we're not allowed to bring in. There's a ladybird that just eats powdery mildew. Mm. Yes, yes, for mealybug. Yep, yep. So, there's wasps that are great for mealybug. Nothing, we haven't got anything yet for the gall wasp. There's no predators for that that we've found. Um, so yeah, the but... Your favourite subject is citrus leaf miner? Citrus leaf miner just use the CLM traps. They work really well. CLM traps. So, it's a little tent. You just hang it in your tree. Put two in. It's got a pheromone, has a little plug in there. The pheromone attracts the male citrus miner and knocks him off. I mean, that's him gone. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the ag department have bred up all the sterile male fruit fly. But they've all been sold to South Australia because the West Australian government said, no, we're not going to, we're not going to, we're not interested, uh, don't need it. Mm, we're not going to invest in it. And South Australia government went, that is brilliant. We'll have that. So they all go over to uh, Adelaide now. But um, Carnarvon, in Carnarvon, all the fruit tree growers got together. They all pooled in their money so that they could get the sterile male fruit fly sent up to Carnarvon. It's the most amazing program. I went, because uh, I've got lots of mates at the Ag Department. There's only about three scientists left now. Um, so they have this, this huge shed where they breed all the maggots. And then they, they it's, it's amazing that they can do it. So they separate the male and the, f the female. And then they irradiate the male. And then they dye them blue. Incredible. There's millions. You walk in, there's just cages full of flies and maggots everywhere. It's awesome. <laughs> and they're breeding a blowfly for the blueberry industry. There's a particular bush fly that, uh, that they're using to control other pests on the blueberry plants. Well, they're so clever. I should have been an entomologist. Oh, sorry, it is too. Yes, 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 reporter. Thank you very much. Reporter, thank you. <coughs> Other questions? How are we going for time? Oh, heaps of time. Um, they were described to Stephen, Harry and John, before he passed away, put out a, a lot of photographs of Oh, and they are beautiful. Oh, and fantastic! Help transfer ten thousand of these slides. Wow! Onto a CD. That's amazing. Ten thousand. Ten thousand slides. 
And that was only done basically in the Quinana and up north. Wow. That's the thing. You see, there's so much out there we don't even know is out there. I want to tell you something else about spiders. You're all going to want to just... Ha, you just you will just want to breed spiders when you when I finish this. No, no, no. So, uh, one of the one of the guys from the ag department, he was involved in a uh, a camp, a bush camp for kids with the school. So they had because they were going off road, so they had four wheel drives and all the kids, you know, and camping out and all the who dang stuff. So they went up and they, they went down this track and uh, so they stopped and they camped there and then the kids came back home the next day and one of the, the, kid, one of the kids lifted up their bag and a, and a wolf spider came out, quite a large one. And so the mother rang the school and she wanted to sue the school because <laughs> the child... <laughs> You know, it was freaked out. So because he's a scientist, he thought, now this is interesting. Why did the spider go into the bag? So he went back there and there were a few cars there and they all had their engines running. And when he looked underneath the vehicles, there were all these spiders underneath the cars. So they couldn't figure out what was going on, so they turned the cars off and the spiders left. And then they went to another part of the track and they did the same thing. Just left, the cars were stationary, left the engines running, spiders came to the cars. And then they figured out it's vibration. So the spiders, like most animals, feel vibration. They're very sensitive to vibration. Of course, with spiders, with their legs and all the little hairs on their feet, can really, they're very sensitive to vibration. So they went straight to the source of the vibration. So it's like when um, animals, can, they can sense an earthquake long before it comes because they sense the vibration in the ground. So he managed to save the school because that's the reason the spider, not because the teachers were neglectful and for God's sake. Um, what did they expect? Yeah, I know, you're going out bush. Well, surprise, there's <laughs> things that live there. There's a, there's a mob that go around to schools called spineless creatures. Oh, yeah. They're fantastic. So they go around to all the schools and they've got all sorts of things. And did you know that scorpions glow in the dark? I didn't know that. Fantastic. Awesome little things. But I digress. Um, okay, let's talk about irrigation. So, number one, make sure that your soil absorbs the water first. There's lots of different wetting agents out there, but we all know that after a while, they're not going to cut the mustard. So you may have to use them again and again. If you get the um, organic ones or the ones that have uh, been the uh, um, lawn, the turf industry, spit it out, the turf industry have made their own uh, wetting agent uh, based on a lot of trials that they've done. So it is, oh, you know, my pest guide reporter. Um, so... So, there's the wetting agent is called Aquaforce and the retainer. So, what happens, what happens is there's a waxy coating on the sand and that's what repels the water. So, the wetting agent breaks down that waxy coating. But that's only one part of what a wetting agent should do. After that, it should make sure that the water actually is held in the soil. So, the turf industry came up with this. Viagra. <laughs> <laughs> now, so the aquaforce breaks down the waxy coating 
the Biagra makes the water molecules stick to the sand. It's clever, isn't it? Um, it's actually very, very good. And I don't know where you get it from because I get mine directly from the turf. But if you, if you Google it, it'll tell you where to get it from. Um, there's, there is, there's some very good wetting agents out there. Some areas of your soil will be extremely hydrophobic and you may need to add the wetting agent up to three times in one day to actually break that down. But you will have to use it. People never think to use it in winter. That's when you should be using it the most because that rainfall that we get, you want it to sink into the soil. And we all know as gardeners, after a big heavy rainfall, you can dig down 15 centimetres in your soil and it's bone dry. But a lot of that is from the mulch that people are using. So steer clear of those wood chip mulches. That's a great question. What's the best way of applying this so that the water actually does get down into the soil? All wetting agents must be activated by water. Now what, so th these are all click on, click on jobbies. So what you need to do before you apply the, the wetting agent is you must wet the ground first. It won't go very far, it'll probably roll off, but wet the ground first. Then you use the aquaforce or whatever wetting agent, whether it's liquid or granular, must be activated by water, but you have to pummel it into the ground. So it's no point in just putting a sprinkler on for 10 minutes and think that that will get the, the wetting agent into the soil. It will not penetrate it. You need the hose, you need to stand there with the garden hose on high jet and pummel it into the soil. And then the next day you water it again and that will help it sink through. So a few days after the aquaforce, then you put in your Biagra, you put the retainer in. Some wetting agents have the both in the one bottle. Um, but so there's uh, Eco Wet, there's uh, the Grosorb, and then there's the Turbo Wet. They have the two combined, but it doesn't last as long. So is that just for anything, not just for lawn? Everything, oh. everything. It's the same with those microbes, you put it on everything because it's just for the soil. So it's the same with the wetting agents, it's just for the soil. Um, now there's, there's drip irrigation, there's inline irrigation, there's sprayers, there's all sorts of things now. If you have inline drip irrigation or you have the MP rotators, they're the things that go They are low, they're low pressure water droppers on them. So you've got to make sure that you have them on for longer. So the Water Corp, who are my best friends, um, they put out a statement saying 10 minutes, three times, twice a week. That is not that was a bad thing to do because all irrigation systems are different and their outflow is different. It depends how much water comes out per hour, how many litres come out of that particular type of sprinkler. That's what you should be timing it on. So there's no standard time. So the um, underground drip irrigation system, you need that on for 30 to 40 minutes. The MP rotators, they have to be on for 25 minutes because the amount of water that's being delivered out of them is a lot less than those, the, the spray ones. So get the system that's suitable for your garden. If you live in a really windy area, then of course the subsurface irrigation is going to be much better than your water blowing all over the road. It is worthwhile talking to someone who knows about irrigation because everyone thinks they can do it themselves. And you know, a lot of it you can. But there's some fantastic stuff out there now that all the irrigation or retic people know about. 
So go to a reticulation specialist, say this is what I've got, what would you suggest is the best system? It's easy to have a controller, it, you know, it, it's, most of us don't have time to stand there and individually hose garden beds. So reticulation is essential. I think it's, you know, it'll save your garden from dying, especially if you ask your children to look after your plants, they'll definitely die. I was only away for a week. And I said to, every morning I'd talk to Jess and go, now have you watered my plants? I reckon she must have done this, gone <laughs> And then that was it. <laughs> Never let children in charge of looking after your garden. Because um, there are different systems out there that would suit, you know, different, different sort of situations. And there was something else on water I had to t talk about. Um, a lot of people are using uh, recycled water. If you are using your brown water or recycled water, you must be careful what detergents you're using. Never have it going to the one spot. Move it around. So you need to, all, all the grey water systems, you need to make sure that you're going to different areas so that you know, after a couple of weeks or a month, then that will, I wouldn't leave it for more than two weeks. That area actually gets um, skim water, fresh water, whatever. Uh, so you can, and that's the thing about if you've got irrigation guys putting in your grey water system, they'll have a valve on it so that you can switch it from, it'll go to different zones at different times. But you, you've got to use the grey water detergents if you're using that. If you've got rainwater tanks, you usually don't need to use those tanks when it's raining. So you can have that plumbed into your toilet and your washing machine. And of course, for your compost. If you are, compost is, um, all those microbes are very sensitive to chlorine. So if you can get rainwater to use in your compost, that's better. If you are ever using copper-based fungicides get distilled water or rainwater because the chlorine in our water completely changes the efficacy of copper-based sprays. So it really negates the effectiveness of, of copper-based sprays. So always get distilled water or... When I lived in Kalgoorlie, um, the water up there was so hard, you just, you, you, your kettle was gone after about... You know, three, it's a bit like Esperance, actually, that was the same. So um, distilled water, is, it's, handy, it's handy to have around for the garden. If you've, got, um, if you've got composting worms, don't be tempted to put those in your garden beds. Earthworms are very different to composting worms. Composting worms are like the princesses of the worm world. So once the, the water source and the food source dries up, they'll die. Earthworms go much deeper down. So it's really good to try and encourage earthworms. So a way of doing that is to put in manures and compost and all that humic acid. Um, that's, what they'll, that's what they'll eat. If you've got a worm farm, the best thing to do is put the food in a processor so it's small chunks rather than great lumpy chumps. It's very good. I think it's great. I think it's great that we're recycling um, and reusing. But if, if you haven't got it, one of the best things to do is to dig your veggie scraps into the garden. Put it straight in. If you're no good at composting <laughs> and you've tried that and gone, mm, that didn't work, dig it straight in the garden. If you've got a Labrador, however, that may <laughs> not be <laughs> The rats will come and dig it up. That's the other thing, yeah. So, um, yes, <laughs> that, is, that is a point. Unless, of course, you provide them with all the fresh stuff that's already on there. They're like, why bother digging? Um, so it, it, it breaks down really quickly. When you dig your veggie scraps in the, uh, in the garden, it's gone within a week. I've got, um, so I'm on, it, my block's 930. So I, I still use my green bin for, for, the, yeah, for all the tree prunings and um, my kids fill it up because they haven't got them yet. Um, 
But things like all the lawn clippings go straight back on the garden. I don't compost the lawn clippings. It's full of nitrogen. Why waste that nitrogen, I say? So I put it straight on the garden because I do not have cooch. Do not do that if you have cooch. Because you'll have cooch everywhere. Um, so lawn clippings are fine to put around your trees. No problem whatsoever. Don't waste all that stuff. But I have, there's lots of green waste at my place, so. You've got a shredder, so we shred it and we just put it. Shredding's great. So you prune, you have the shredder right near your garden bed, go straight back to the bed. That's one of the most efficient and effective ways of recycling. They're great. Shredders are great. I just, I'm never home really to shred. But yeah, all the food stuff goes either to my neighbours across the road who've got chickens or goes straight into my veggie garden. Not really. And don't forget with trees, like trees are such an emotive issue and verge trees in particular. Like they just set people off. Um, so, you know, the, 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 the amount of impact now that verge trees and parks and gardens will have will be enormous because people don't have the room in their yards anymore. So families don't, you know, a lot of, a lot of the new builds, there's no trees at all because they think there's no room. I always think there's room for a tree. Um, so the, our street trees and our parks are going to be essential to cooling our climate down. So there's going to be a lot of pressure on local councils to really hammer the whole verge tree planting thing and, and keep the parks and gardens in good condition because it, people there'll be a lot more people going to them because there's no other, no other source for them. So definitely, yes, they're definitely looking at species that will cope with a change in climate, with a drop in rainfall. The other thing is timing of planting. Traditionally, all the planting would be done May, June, July, whereas we're not getting rain in May and June. So they're even now looking at timing of planting. So that has to change along with the changing climate because we've got to put them in at the most appropriate time. And the other thing the City of Melville are doing, uh, uh, they know that they have to water for a bit longer to get those trees up. And in terms of sustainability and a plant's adaptability, they're looking at changing from the 100 litre bag trees to 35 litre bag trees because they settle in and they are so much healthier, much stronger. They require less water as well. So, you know, it's, it's a much more sustainable way. And because they're going down to the 35 litre bags, they've got a much broader range of species they can use. And they're working with tree farms and saying, okay, we now need trees that, you know, have to survive on this amount of rainfall a year. So they're, you know, they're very proactive in, in doing this and very proactive about tree canopy and getting that coverage back. Okay, so if you've got a small garden and you've got some trees in there so you actually don't have the capacity to dig and do all that, then you have to go up. You have to raise, you have to have raised beds so that you build the soil up. Now, depending on what the tree is, the tree roots will suck all that up. If it's particularly eucalypts, they're very gum trees, very, it's not a gum tree. No, you should be fine. You should be fine. But you'll need to, you'll need, so the minimum height is 30 centimetres that you need if you want to grow veggies. Um, but that's a, that's a very good question because more and more people will have that. They've got a, you know, a confined space. So they want a tree for the shade and the coolness, but they also want to be able to grow their own veggies or some fruit trees. All fruit trees now, just about all fruit trees, you can get in dwarf size, which makes them ideal for pots. The only thing I would say to be very, very cautious of is... There's the dwarf mulberry, and I've now seen four of them, and they're huge. <laughs> <laughs> and I would never, ever, ever trust someone telling me 
that they have created a dwarf lemon scented gum. <laughs> we'll see is all I can say. Because I've got one in my backyard and it's magnificent. I truly love it. My neighbour does not because he put a pool right underneath it, which I thought was very silly. When he was putting it in, I said to him, you know that that's a gum tree and it <coughs> drops all year round. And he said, I was hoping you'd take it out. <laughs> <laughs> I laughed. <laughs> so, and a lot of councils are using that. They're using the tree barriers, the root, the root barriers. You used a garbage bin, same thing cost you a lot less. Um, so they're using root barriers in um, on lots of verges now so that the and you know they're usually over a metre high so one one and a half metres so that the root system has to go down and then once it gets down then it can go out. So root but um, but that's for when you're newly planting trees once the tree is there of course you, you can't do that. Yes, the, a lot of the land care um, people use it because it's grass, it's, it's poaceae family, so it only kills a certain type of uh, plant, so um, the, the monocots, so um, that's safe to use. They, they use it along riversides and things where you've got invasive grasses, um, unless of course it's a native grass and then it's buggered as well. But yeah, that's, well, I, well, you used to have to get a license, but someone, you don't anymore. It's expensive. It's like a hundred, about a hundred bucks, I think, hundred and, and so the, the, the place, you won't get it from uh, Bunnings or anywhere, but Mirko Brothers have it. So you don't need a license for that now? No, apparently not. I've got yeah, so yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. I'd be worried about it yeah. too. That's the big problem with a lot of, you know, most of our herbicides and, and a lot of the um, pesticides that are on the market, you should actually, I reckon you should have a licence because yeah. it's yeah. toxic yeah. stuff. And people don't know how to use it and they don't no. understand what they're killing and the you know, waterways. And yep, the that's exactly right. So so I, because that's what I said on air, oh, you need a, a license to be able to, because you have to understand how yeah. it works and why it works and what it does. Courses. I went to TAFE to learn how to use it. Yep. So this lady here went to TAFE to learn how to use it. So it, we're talking agricultural chemicals, okay? It's not, yeah. it's not stuff that you give to your year seven science yeah, kid to take home. I didn't think I should just go buy it. I didn't think I should just go buy it. Well, you never used to be able to, but I had a phone call from uh, a listener after the program and she said, oh, no, I just worked into Merco Brothers and just bought it. You don't need a licence anymore. Yeah. Kaikuya is, Kaikuya is good to, to solarise. Okay. To, Coot is a mongrel thing to get rid of, <laughs> seriously. Never, ever attempt to dig Coot out. You are just encouraging it to grow. It's going to laugh at you. <laughs> so, um, so unfortunately, that's why people use Roundup, Fusilade, because it's such a bastard of a thing to get rid of. Um, but all the other types of lawns, you can solarise them. So midsummer, you get clear plastic. This works in midsummer. You get clear plastic. You lay it over it, and it actually cooks itself to death. If it's in winter, then you can go the black plastic. So you cut off all the sunlight. Um, the, the thing about pesticides is that um, all the systemic pesticides, you have to remember with all the agricultural stuff, which is many of our pesticides, you, you just buy them in a 200 litre drum, basically, for agricultural use. They are not allowed to test it on humans. Of course. So they test it on rats, rabbits. So they know what happens to rats and rabbits, but we don't know what happens once it's in the food chain over generations. And I truly believe that the reason that kids now have developed so many allergies, there's all these 
weird autoimmune diseases, there's new cancers popping up. It has to be something to do with the food we are eating because that's the one thing that is across the board. So the cancers and the allergies are far more prone in first world countries where we monoculture, where we have huge agricultural areas that we bomb with herbicides and with pesticides. The mob that made these, these soil microbes they had a huge problem with um, spider mite, the two spotted, you know, the red spider mite. He went out in the field one morning because they just thought, that's it, we're not using any more, we're just not using pesticides anymore. He went out one morning, it was a, like a winter's morning, and looked across the paddock and there were millions of spider webs. The spiders ate all the spider mites. He's never sprayed since for spider mite. And they're both arachnids, so they're both spider, so it was spider on spider. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> but, you know, the thing about your own home garden, you're not growing, you're not getting your living from growing what's in your garden. And the more of those sorts of things we use, the more we kill off all those things that are so necessary in this system that's on the planet that we live in. So if you have a pest or a disease issue, don't reach for the fastest thing to kill something because that's not really, in the long term, that's not beneficial. What we want to do is we want to try and encourage this system to reform and rejoin and reconnect. And part of that is the responsibility of us as gardeners. So we can give back. It's really important to remember that we are one species among many. We deserve, they deserve, all those other species deserve to have a place within that system. And the more we err from that, the worse it's going to be for us. Climate change is just one thing. Climate change is going to bring some huge challenges for us. But if we keep divorcing ourselves from the natural system that's around us, it's only going to get worse because we are ignoring all the little things that nature has been telling us for quite some time now. We are looking at, at losing up to 60% of the insects on the planet. This planet cannot survive without insects. They are vitally important within this system. We have to think about the long-term effects, not just for us, not for our grandchildren, not for our great-grandchildren, but I'm talking our great-great-great-great-great-grandchildren. And everything in nature teaches us something. And that's why as gardeners, we are very privileged to be able to have that connection somehow. And wherever you can, take children out into nature. Show them these little systems that occur around. And it's imperative that we look at our gardens as being a haven for other things apart from ourselves. And I think that makes us much better people. It creates a much better world in the long term and it creates something sustainable for our children. So all this is linked in. You know, we look at the soil as a living organism. We look at the plants as part of a system that many things depend on. We're going to look at, you know, the, the role of pests and diseases. It's like us, we all have to die sometime. Sure as hell, my kids don't want me living forever. It's all, it's, all, it's, all, it's all part of a system. And, you know, if there's one thing that I want you to go home with this afternoon is that you are providing habitat for many, many, many different things. You are an integral part of this system. So we must do it gently and we must do it with compassion and we must do it, most of all, with great generosity to share this space.
And on that note, I'll leave that. Thank you.